Make it happen Friday. The Art and Cultural Site of Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Grace. Because you are with us on our Anything Can Happen Friday. So anything can happen today that we have a veteran in the music industry in Malaysia. Who else if it's not Pete Teo? Oh. <laughs> so Hi, everybody. Welcome him. Hi. <laughs> Oh my God, you make me sound so old, veteran. Well, you're still young at heart. Um, talking about yourself uh, off air earlier, you've been sharing to us a lot of interesting stuff about uh, your life's journey, how you became a musician. But first of all, where does the spark of music interest, you know, came to you? You know, when is it at a very young age, or did you uh, realize that you love music, you know, only later in life? Nothing that special. I think that obviously I love music from when I was a kid, um, and I didn't really take music seriously as a profession until probably when I was, I was in my late teens. What kind of music at that time like influenced the way you understand music? I've, I've never that been that interested in the music of my my time. Are you strange enough? I mean, I've always been sort of interested in ten years or fifteen years before now. Mm. Right. It's, uh, it's, and what was your time again? <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, I say in the 80s, um, I would have been interested in 70s music and, and 60s music. I wasn't that interested. I mean, when people, all my peers were jumping around with sort of guys at Duran Duran, I was, like, I was listening to um, people 10, 15 years ago. I was listening to Dylan. I, was, I still listen to Dylan now, actually. Mm. I was listening to Dylan. I was, I was listening to people like Cohen. I was mm. listening to uh, Led Zap was a big influence. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, my first band was a heavy metal band, so... You grew up in Sabah. Has Sabah influenced you more? Because, uh, I mean, us growing up in uh, the peninsula, we have been o- always been exposed to that stereotype, you know, Malay, Chinese, Indian. But growing up in Sabah, were you exposed to something, um, I guess, closer to that, that idea of Malaysia at that time? I, now, I didn't know this until much later when I mm-hmm. when I came to live in KL. But when I was growing up in Sabah, um, you take it for granted that everybody just got along. I mean, mm-hmm. you, know, you don't really care what, which direction you pray to or what's your name or what's your colour. And that still tend to be the case in Sabah today. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to when, uh, sort of like 20 odd years later when I uh, moved to KL. The first couple of years, honestly, I, I was in a culture shock. Uh, um, because you can almost feel the tension here, you know, in 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 comparison to to Sabah or or Sarawak. So yeah, I mean, I, um, I think the sort of ideal type Malaysia that we all think about and love, in a way, it existed more in the east, in East Malaysia. Talking about the races in Malaysia, I mean, as a third party sort of perspective, <laughs> coming from outside of Malaysia here, um, I've always thought that uh, KL uh, Peninsula, this area is very well highlighted via media than uh, all those perhaps the issues that that happen in Sarah, uh, Sabah or Sarawak and uh, I believe the media plays a huge role and that sort of crafts and also shapes the whole images uh, in society and among generation to generation and when the image is already set the, it doesn't stop there like I mentioned it could pass down from generation to generation and it becomes either modernized or it Become, it's just a sort of stepping backwards kind of style. Mm-hmm. So I guess the races in Malaysia, that's why it's more complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't know when you actually uh, go to Peninsula Malaysia, but did you get some kind of culture shock when yeah. when people started to like uh, categorize you? Oh, you are Chinese, so <laughs> this is the kind of stereotype I will put on you. Not really. I, th- I think I mean you know whatever happens, one is one's ethnicity I mean you can't run away from that mm-hmm. and that's very clear from the way you look and, and, and what you wear and what you speak and so on I think it becomes more of a problem when it is accentuated in, in, in many cases in a bad way mm-hmm. by politicians for their own particular gain I think if you leave most people to themselves, I mean, we don't have a problem really. I think I, I <laughs> certainly don't have a problem. I but what kind of culture yeah. sh- culture shock did you have when you arrived in Kale? In terms of what uh, area particularly? Oh, just maybe, the, maybe just maybe mainly the stupidity of things. <laughs> oh no! Ding 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 ding! <laughs> what Sabah is not in Malaysia? Is in Malaysia? <laughs> no, I think mainly mainly how how silly things can get mm-hmm. when you. 
when you I mean people you know, perhaps your generation think mm-hmm. that say recently the people taking the, wanting to take down the, the crucifix of, of the <laughs> church I mean you think right. that is new that's not new you know that go back for, for decades mm-hmm. I mean why <laughs> why is that an issue mm-hmm. why is one's religion an issue I mean if you look at the constitution of this country uh, it has always been plural Mm-hmm. It's always been multicultural, and it's it's in a way gotten worse over the last thirty, forty years. Mm-hmm. So, and my experience of Mal- Malaysia has always been, obviously, uh, driven by East Malaysia. Mm-hmm. But how, coming to the peninsula was a big shock because th- all those issues we didn't think much of suddenly became an issue. But you know, one thing that um, somehow left a really deep uh, dent to my heart when it comes to your music was, I remember the first time uh, listening to your probably your first CD after you come back to mm-hmm. Malay after you came back to Malaysia and I, I remember listening to Jesslyn tonight mm, Jesslyn tonight uh, yeah. Jesslyn tonight sorry yeah. about that and um, I, I heard it from a CD from a, a magazine now it's already defunct Clue, Clue, Clue magazine <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I noticed how you intertwine all the different uh, local elements in the music mm. and, and that has been Somehow, your trademark, in a way, you try not just to create like one genre of music, but you try to mix and match different culture, different elements, different maybe even mindset about mm. certain music. Why, why, why do you follow that kind of path? Like many of my 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 peers, and I suppose even now with many young people, I think you, as musicians, our primary influence are. Uh, imported mainly from the West, to be honest, but yep. also from other places. But mainly from, in this case, probably top forty America or, mm-hmm. or top forty UK. That's fine when you're, you're you're a kid. That's fine when you're sort of you know fourteen, fifteen, twenty one, or whatever it is. But beyond a certain point, you ask a question. Uh, you ask deeper questions about the music that you do. I mean, what is this? I mean, am I just going to copy Led Zap? I mean, how boring is that? You know, uh, they're a great band. But you know, why would you? Why would you want to be them? Uh, you start asking questions that are deeper about your your work. Always related to obviously the cultural baggage and the background, the social, political, cultural background that you come from. At that, when you know, Jefferson tonight and that record it was probably my attempt at, at trying to do that and mm. uh, trying to address address the whole issue about what what is the identity of what you're trying to do and uh, and it comes out as that. I'm not saying that I would do it. Again, actually, I mean, I mean, if I were to do it now, I probably wouldn't do it the same way, to be right. honest with you. But, uh, but then it seemed like a wonderful idea, and I, I don't regret it, of course, because that gave me quite a lot of success. But, um, mm-hmm. but one thing that you regretted, I don't know whether it's true or not. Mm-hmm. You were in the pop band before. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> I think, yeah, I was in a pop band. In Hong Tell Kong. us about it. Uh, <laughs> When I was at university, I had three bands, uh, and this was in London, and uh, and and two of the bands were really serious, and they were like jazz bands and fusion bands, and and full of really really good musicians. But I also had one sort of kind of fun band that <laughs> we didn't take very seriously, really. We sort of play a bit of pop, a canto pop, a bit of this. Uh, we weren't very good, to be honest with you. We were we were shit actually. But, I mean, um, can't wait to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the uh, but the, that joke band, that fun band, got signed, and the serious band didn't get signed. So and it was signed to Hong Kong. So <laughs> that's how I actually end up in Hong Kong. Actually, my career properly as a recording artist uh, started in Hong Kong. Um, so I make a couple of records with that band uh, in Hong Kong. Did you have to like dance or become the next Backstreet Boy? Hong no, Kong actually, I, I did something? everything apart from that. Actually, <laughs> I, 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 I pretty much did everything in the band. I wrote, I produced, I played almost everything, and except I didn't sing it because I, then I didn't. I wasn't convinced I was a singer, to be honest. I, well, I've always yeah. been uncomfortable with the pop industry, you see. So I mean, I'm not really a very good pop musician. I'm not a very good popular. I mean, in in, <laughs> in, ter- in terms of the the requirement right. uh, uh, required by most uh, commercial labels. I was a terrible artist because I we signed a three album deal after two album I escaped. I just I just left. I just I can't deal with this anymore. Alright. Yeah I just left. I mean we had a top ten record. Nobody understood why we le- I left. It wasn't to me any uh, about music anymore. Packaging and, mm-hmm. and I don't mind the packaging. It goes with uh, being a professional musician but mm-hmm. to become music altogether that's when I started 
you know, why am I doing this? Because mm-hmm. this is silly, really. I mean, um, and I'm one of those people who, who's, who's had, who's, who, who had a lot of choices. And, you know, I'm educated. I don't, I didn't feel that I needed music to make a living. Uh, so I left and I teach, strange enough, <laughs> at the university. <laughs> and, uh, and I decided to take a three month break before I did that. And, uh, and uh, I thought, well, I've never been to KL. Three months in KL and blink, I'm here now. (laughs) (laughs) Three months becomes like 20 years. And we'll talk more about that when we return. Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural side of Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Welcome back, this is Grace. And of course, you're still with us and Pete Teo talking about, of course, him. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, everybody. And and your life. (laughs) Your journey, your, your your journey in life, I guess. Um, uh, I mean, you you have established in yourself as a musician, but then you didn't just stop there. You move on and do something else, uh, something more than that. What was it? Um, and why? <laughs> I got bored. <laughs> I, are you referring to what me sort of moving into making videos, making yeah. films, and things like that? Yeah, that was like two oh seven, two oh eight. We got to move further. To further back actually to understand this because uh, what happened was when I first decided to go back into music having walked away from my my label yep. <laughs> <laughs> was that I decided well, to, to just you know not play in a band anymore and, and started playing solo and uh, because I was frankly speaking too lazy to rehearse <laughs> and I started playing a lot in No Black Tie the old No Black Tie in KL sort of became very important to me because that be- became the trajectory of my career really uh, that also became the sort of proving ground where I learned how to play live solo effectively. It's very different from playing in a band and playing solo. Oh, Any really? musician can tell you. Yeah, very wow, uh, I didn't know. So I learned my tricks there, really, uh, and, and, and many, many good teachers. Uh, and also I met a lot of young, up-and-coming artists there. because That, that was during 2007? Uh, no, that was about Earlier. 2002, 2001, oh. 2003, that period. And at that time, the indie scene started to become more and more robust. It's, yeah, it was just starting, really. Yeah. I mean, in, in the present form, and mm-hmm. it's in the sense that people are playing original music, it's going down quite deep to the grassroots and not a creation of the label. Mm-hmm. It had an organic sort of mm-hmm. and at that thing about one, it. And if I'm not mistaken, there's this one uh, local indie independent uh, label that started to churn out a lot of really... Positive tone. Yeah, yeah positive tone. Yeah. Positone was before that. Positone was, was in that. the 90s, actually. It started mm-hmm. by a friend of mine. But Positone was a label thing, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, what differentiates that? I mean, it's wonderful the work that Positone has done. But what differentiates what their work was and what's happened subsequently in the in the noughties mm-hmm. uh, was that there were a lo- loads of young bands who had no deals, but they play anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they were playing to an audience. And so often labels become house. irrelevant. Well, they're still relevant, but it's at very that important that, that, that the labels operate at the industry level. But... At the grassroots level, there is action too, because really, I mean, before before bands get signed, they ought to have a circuit where they're playing and learning, and that's really important because mm-hmm. you don't want to get signed and don't don't know what you're doing as a musician. That's terrible. You you're not going to improve that like that. I think it's very important that you know how to handle yourself on stage and so on and so forth. And that was what the circuit was then, mm-hmm. especially with the singer songwriter scene. It was very very. Uh, actually quite powerful actually that scene it became oh really yeah and it also kind of centered around no black tie was that the only scene at that time that as far as the singer songwriter of course there are other scenes sub subcultural scenes that they were the punk scene they were like mm. yeah, obviously the electronica music scene and so on and so forth but around no black tie was mainly singer songwriter acoustic music which is really what i do so there were a lot of young singer songwriters right uh, coming up and and you know guys like reza saleh com- came from that scene guy like uh, <laughs> Um, and before me, there were guys like uh, Rafik and all those guys. I mean, they're all basically acoustic guitar guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's more reminiscent of the New York bitter end type acoustic folk scene, really. Mm-hmm. And that was quite a, a, an important thing for me, anyway, because I, I sort of grew my career from that. And more importantly, in, in terms of your question, more importantly was was I met a lot of young artists there who were at the same stage of development, i.e. penniless and no opportunity and, uh-huh. and very angry. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and and many of them were filmmakers. And so they thought, well, you know, well, Pete has got, you know, got a 
top ten record, and uh, maybe we should get him to act in our film. Maybe more people watch our <laughs> film. <laughs> that was actually how how it started. Uh, serious? That was how it started. Yeah. Uh, because they thought, and they were wrong, of course. I mean, they, 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 <laughs> thought, <laughs> they thought a lot of people would see that film because I was in it. So, and so I sort of making I started making a lot of films as an actor. So I I went out with them, and we we basically became really good friends. We work a lot together. I started working as composer as well. You and compose music for their films. Yeah, for their films. So mm. And obviously, that's w- that's also the scene where I knew uh, I got to know Yasmin Ahmad, mm. whom I also obviously wrote music for. This was before Serpil, I suppose. Actually, quite strange. This was about when Serpil came, uh, came up because I kept mm. a blog, blog then, and and one day I I had an email and from this woman called Yasmin Ahmad. <laughs> I had no idea who she was. Ah, <laughs> right. Thank and goodness you didn't ignore the email. <laughs> uh, no, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of your music. She bought the record, and I'm a big fan of your music, and I've just made this film. I would love for you to see it. Would right. you come into my office and have a look at my film? And they were serpent, so I hate it. Ah, <laughs> oh, my I goodness. really don't like it, you know. I, I, why why didn't you like it's it? It's sweet, it's, uh, it's cute, and I'm not a cute guy. Right. You know what I'm it's sort of more into romantic, yeah, sweet romantic it's, and I said no I don't, li- I don't like it at all but you know what Yasmin I really admire you for it because I think you just made the most important film for the last 30 years so yeah fantastic I mean personally I, 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 I can't I can't do work like that alright because but I admire a piece of wonderful brave work and it was a very brave film because uh, it painted it 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 was in some ways a political film, you know. People mm-hmm. don't see it as a political film, but it is actually a political film. I mean, it paints a Malaysia that that she wants to see, really, and that, that, that we know that doesn't that often doesn't exist. Yeah. So I said, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, anything I could help you with, please let me know. I, I think you're wonderful. So we became friends, and uh, a few few smaller pieces before that, but yes, ended up in. In t- with talent time with I go and mm. Bergie, yeah. <laughs> Fifteen Malaysia started because I I got I made a video called Here My Home completely un- unintentional. It was <laughs> and and I I don't know how you make it under zero budget, non partisan. I have no idea, but I mean <laughs> it, 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 I, it was I was I was gonna have a month off because I'd been working for like five years without break. You know, being an indie musician, you work everything. You know, behind the scene, you're doing your own contracts and so on. And the uh, and my record was just hitting Korea and Japan, so I was quite busy. And 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 then it came 2007, late 2007. I took a month off. I got bored, frankly, and I was sitting down with my assistant. I said, "I'm just after two days. I said, oh, I can't do it. There's nothing oh, to do. No. Let's do something." And he actually said, "Albert is his name." And Albert still still works with me now. And Albert said, uh, "Why don't you just make a sort of..." Video? Anti-racism thing, you know, oh. sort of, yeah, some we are the world thing. I thought you don't deal with like. Well, exactly. Uh, my reaction was pui. <laughs> you know, I mean, who wants to make we are the world? That's so boring. And uh, then I sort of slept on it, and I thought, uh, actually, you know, it's, the issue is important, though. You know, you shouldn't let whether it is trendy or not affect something that's more important than than just being cool and trendy. And anyway, if you're good enough, you make it cool and trendy. You don't, mm-hmm. you know, and so on. So so I thought about it, and I thought, yeah, let's try. And the first person I called um, was Aflin, Aflin mm-hmm. Sharky. And I said, Aflin, you know, i got this really weird idea. i got no money. Mm-hmm. So I want to I wanna make this video, and sh- uh, would you want to help me do this? Uh, I want to get all these people together and, and make this video. And I said, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll help you. And uh, what song are you thinking about? And I thought, well, maybe we'll license John Lennon. We do Imagine, we do something. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but I guess the, the licensing was a bit expensive. It was way too expensive. <laughs> so we called up uh, the publisher. In this case, it was, I believe, EMI. And EMI quoted us something like 30 grand. And I thought, <laughs> Listen, you're kidding? You know? So I said, ah, hell, you're a songwriter, write one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that so, makes sense. <laughs> well, it sort of, yeah, it sort of makes sense. And uh, so I wrote it in one night. And, and then in one night? Yeah, it was really, really quick. I mean, <laughs> Probably think about your... Not really. It was just, wife. yeah, you just scribble, <laughs> scribble, scribble, and it's there. And, uh, and, uh, and then the next day, I sort of called Yasmin up. And I said, hey, Yasmin, you know, you want to direct this thing for me? I'll sing it to you. So I sing it to you on the phone, badly, because yeah, I, I can't sing that song even to today, you know. And... Um, <laughs> But you did sing in the I video. I sang one line. It's very different. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different from singing the whole song. And I sang very badly. And, and she said, yeah, I love the song. Let's let's do it. And so she came on board. Yu Hong came on board to co-direct it. Mm. And we sort of, by the end of the first day of calling, 
uh, had something like eight people. Mm. I think I, f- I can remember the first person I called after Afrin was, uh, of course, Yasmin. And then after that was... Um, I also saw Hari Iskandar. Awi. I called Awi. 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 Yeah, I called Awi. Mean by right. Zura. Ning, yeah. By, by sort of the sort of third day, we had 20 people. By the wow. seventh day, we had something like 50 people. And the whole team, actually, I mean, we assemb- essentially, eventually, rather, um, assembled a team in front and at the back of camera of more than 200 people. Wow. Everybody worked for free. Yeah. Everybody. Mm. From editors to camera people to hospitality teams to that's amazing to the stars in front of the camera to the people who rented the mm-hmm. equipment to K- KL Pack who gave us the the stage of course who donated. When, when you look back, you know all this thing that happened for that particular video clip. Do you think it would be able? I mean, someone were able to replicate the of same course, thing again? Of course. I mean, you do have to be honest. I mean, one thing that we've always had, and people always ask me this: How do you get all these people to do this for you? I said there's no magic. I don't feed them a pill or anything. It's 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 just you've got to mean it. I mean mm. you've got to be honest about it and mean it. I yeah, the early version of Sai Azmi, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the guy. I think it's important to to just want to do it mm. for the right reason. Yeah, I think, that's true. I, I think I think that honesty comes across, mm-hmm. and I I don't take on projects I don't believe mm-hmm. in. That's one thing. Mm-hmm. I've never done that ever since I left uh, the label. Mm-hmm. I mean, once I decided to come back into music and, and our firm, I made a promise to myself that I would never, ever, ever, ever do anything I don't like again. And, <laughs> and so you only pick projects that you believe in. So, mm-hmm. so that, that's the effect of that. Because, you know, when you talk to somebody, your eyes are glowing. And that, that's persuasive, you know, it's because you can see it. Um, so I guess the, all this hard, hard work paid out after all with the 200 offer people working. Well, There's a lot of people. I mean, I mean, obviously it's not, not just me. I mean, Albert worked really hard on it. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously Aflin worked really hard on it. Um, so there was like a core team of just five or six people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, you know, there were, there were people who cried on set because, you know... Uh, this particular Malay artist, I shan't mention his name, but this particular p- particular Malay artist actually came up to me after the shoot. He was weeping like a baby, and <laughs> he's very famous. and And he gave me a big hug. He said, "You know, Pete, I've been in this industry 20 years. I've never worked with a Chinese person." <gasps> really? Wow. So he so says, it meant a lot to him, you know, in his life experience working. But it, but it, it also shows that um, I mean, when it comes to race based um. In Malaysia, it's not just political party. It's, it's divided even alongside uh, industries of and course. sectors. Of course, yes. Of course. I mean, that's the, that's the problem, I think, one of the problems of the country today, which is yeah. that if you if you go into... Obviously, there's a sort of the Bangsa scene where it's not real Malaysia. I, I mm. hope you, you know Bangsa is not real Malaysia. It's some bubble, <laughs> some middle class bubble, um, where where an interview could happen like what we're doing now. Mm-hmm. And we'll mainly converse in English and we'll have no issue with each other's religion or race mm-hmm. and okay. we talk quite openly about it. And that's the wonderful Malaysia we all love. Mm-hmm. But there's three other Malaysias out there I mean, where, mm-hmm. where a Chinese kid could grow up and go to school and get to early teens without having one single Malay friend. Oh, I can definitely understand yeah, or, that. Or, or the, the, um, the equivalent in the Malay person and so on. So and that's not healthy. That's that's mm-hmm. wrong. That's something that we have to try and change. When when I was growing up in my Chinese school, mm. I had a friend who is Chinese say that you're the only Malay person that I know. Absolutely. And it was in Gomba. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and can you imagine? And I wasn't even like 100% Malay. I was a mixed mm-hmm, race. But mm-hmm. people are so stereotyping. Mm-hmm. Stere- uh, people are so fixed into that idea yep. of stereotypes. That you have to fit into one box yeah. or the other. No, it's unhealthy, yeah. and that's something that we we need to we yeah. need to solve. And I think it's difficult to solve because mm-hmm. it's but permeated a lot of industry and and, and all parts of society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Compared to decades ago and the nowadays, are there a lot of uh, changes when it comes to industry working together? Do people understand mm-hmm. more than before, or is still s- sort of their fundamental is the same? When I think it it's gone races. backwards, actually. I think, I mm. mean, if you go back to the 70s and the 60s, I think there's less of an issue there. People so they were more liberal. Uh, oh, in the far, past, far there are, there's the Shaw Brothers, you know, and Correct. then you have, like, Indian producers yeah. working Correct. together with Malay Correct. actors and Correct. actresses. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think that's largely gone missing now. And uh, there are exceptions, of course. There are a few mm. uh, uh, directors who 
who have multicultural, multi-ethnic cast and crew. Yasmin, obviously, one mm-hmm. of the prime examples. Uh, today, by and large, uh, in the commercial Malay scene mm-hmm. or the commercial Chinese scene, it's been fairly mono-ethnic. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, I believe, wrong. Obviously, there are people who are breaking those rules, like I said before, Yasmin, and right now, say, Dane side breaks that, and so on. Uh, so there are people of all, sa- all shades, but I don't think it's en- enough. I think, mm-hmm. you know, that needs to carry on more. Anyway, take, we'll take one short break, and when we return, we'll discuss more with Pete Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural side of Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Welcome back, this is Grace. And of course, you're still with us and Pete Teo on our Anything Can Happen Friday. So talking about your... 15 Malaysia you, which you didn't really quite <laughs> answer my question you're know, you know, starting with here in my home because uh-huh. I mean because we were talking about here in my home right? and, 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 and here in my home became a massive massive hit I think it was on radio for months and months on end and, and I think uh, I think um, about 10 or 15 radio stations were playing it 24 times a day It was The rotation was that high And it was uh, yeah. Election season No it wasn't actually It was just people Getting very worried That <laughs> that, that race problems Were getting bad In this country oh, right. and, and especially People in the media So they They supported The, the program uh, The project Like mad And so it became A huge Huge thing And s- school kids Started singing at school. Have you seen that I mean it's a fantastic feeling When school children Are singing a song You wrote for In five minutes It's quite in five weird. minutes, <laughs> yeah, it's quite weird. And, uh, and and due to the success of that, then then a lot of people came came to me to uh, corporations this time wanting right. to to do the same thing. Um, except I didn't want to do the same thing again. It bores me. So that's your rule. <laughs> yeah, that's a rule, man. So I, I don't want to repeat myself. So so I persuaded one of the uh, these sponsors. In fact, in this case, the smallest one uh, called P One. Uh, which is an ISP telco. Uh, that why don't we just make some f- short films instead? We have some really wonderful young directors in this country. They are underexposed. They have no opportunity. Uh, yeah, let's make some films. We say, yeah, fantastic. So, <laughs> what do you want to make with them? I said, well, you know, we should make. I didn't know whether they would say yes or no to this, but I took a risk and I said, we should we should deal with. You know, sensitive stuff. You can do with stuff like uh, racism, pedophilia, corruption. You know all that oh, stuff. Wow. Then, um, to their credit, they got excited. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, they say, yeah. What well, do you think you can get away with it? I say, yeah. Well, if we we are careful, if we we, we are smart about doing things like <laughs> this, uh, we, we'll be fine, I think. And 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 so they went. They went. Okay, let's try that. Let's 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 discuss more. Have you got any any other ideas? And I said, yeah. I mean, since we're doing s- social political stuff, why don't we cast politicians? <laughs> oh, that's where you get Kyrie Jamaluddin. <laughs> yeah. So no, it was not just Kyrie. There was Tian Chuan in there. Yeah. There was there was there was uh, Top Guru was in there, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and so on. So I said, let's let's cast politicians in these little short films. And they could uh, at that point, they got they got they got worried at that point. All right. <laughs> but, but again, cre- way way credit to P1 that, that they they mm-hmm. they went with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were very brave. So how long it took for the whole thing to wrap up? <laughs> uh, production time was about uh, three months, I believe. So for all fifteen all fifteen short films. Yes. But we don't obviously we don't shoot sequentially. We shoot mm-hmm. in parallel. Mm-hmm. There were fifteen teams going out at the same time. Wow. Yeah. yeah, essentially, yeah. So which one was your favorite? I, so I know you wow. probably say that every one of it is my favorite. <laughs> uh, I can't really say. I mean, I just recently came back from America touring 15 Malaysia actually because it's uh, it's been doing the circuits in the world since then actually, mm-hmm. and 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 this year it was doing America. So I was invited to go and I was talking to a lot of students and film school guys and and filmmakers about it. How are the responses? They were amazed by it. I mean, because they they, they sort of suddenly realized that oh my god, that's the minister of health and that's not an actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he could act. How seriously. the hell did he manage to get those people? All oh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was good. I think I think they understand our situation more, mm-hmm. which is a good thing. Um, so you believe the message of of the the film sent through correctly? 
Well, it's, it's sent through in so far that people understand mm. Malaysia better in right. terms of just the good and the bad things. Mm. I think I'm one of those people who don't believe that we should only send out sort of Malaysia truly Asia <laughs> type message because I think that's one, not true. And two, it doesn't really help ourselves. I think you have to acknowledge that there are problems before you solve the problem. So, so to ourselves, we do need to acknowledge that we have uh, a problems in this country and we have to solve it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Question? <laughs> I, just, I thought there was that. Hold on. What what time is it? We can uh, uh, mark the time first. Four minutes. Four minutes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, well, I'm also from the music industry, but I'm still very young in this industry. Just passed for three or four years, and um, only got myself into music industry after I came to, uh, came to Malaysia. But compared to, I mean, you have experiences in Korea and Japan as well. And uh, compared to Korean industry, um, I know you hate pop industry, but we can't ignore the K-pop scene, and that's uh, very huge throughout the Asia. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't seem to be dying that easily. Not only uh, because of the K-pop, but it, it all infusing the elements with the Korean dramas and the movies and lots of stuff. What is your perspectives on the, with uh, uh, to this whole industry or uh, the entertainment industry compared to Malaysia and Korea and perhaps Japan? I think, of course, the the, the biggest difference between the Malaysian, uh, shall we call it, the entertainment or music mm-hmm. industry. Um, it's the size of the market. I mm. think we are the smallest, of course. And we are smaller than most people think. People think of 30 million people. But actually, it's much smaller than that because mm-hmm. if you split 30 million into uh, four languages and then urban and then rural, so each of the markets are very, very small. When you have such a small market, it's very hard to afford a career to many of our artists because there simply is, isn't enough people around to buy your merchandise. Um, that also means that your production budget is lower. Mm. That also means that you know your technical uh, quality, from sound to picture to the quality of musicianship right. and recording and post-production, all those suffer because you don't have a big enough budget because your market is not big mm. enough. Um, Japan, at the other end, obviously, is the biggest of the three, and it's actually the second biggest market in the world. And for that reason alone, uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, I mean, before the K wave came, uh, the the Japanese production has the highest production mm-hmm. value because obviously the the market was the biggest there. But why our market is smaller than, let's say, the East Asian market? Is it because population? It's just pure population, and also because we're fragmented. I see. Yeah. But 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 the Japanese seems to be interested in variety kind of genre. I mean. Um, it's not that. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. I mean, right. You got thirty million people, right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, right now, I believe something like uh, six sixty percent is urban. Yeah. Okay. So sixty percent of thirty million people are urban. Then you split that into uh, four languages. So each individual market is very small. So you don't sell many products. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, add to the fact that we also many of our youngsters are more interested in imported. Uh, tell me Let me do an experiment With you online So I'm going to embarrass you Okay <laughs> Now When was the last time You bought a local racket For me hmm. Actually I can't even remember The last Thank time I even much. bought a racket Thank you Okay Now If you have bought Now Of the films that you see How many percent Is a local film In terms of ticket No it doesn't matter Even video Very Doesn't few. matter Ten percent, five percent, one in ten, maybe. I think between one in one twenty, to five. more like one in fifty. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's your answer for you. We have a small market, mm-hmm. right? So when you have that, uh, that's why it's important for for our people to support local, because mm-hmm. actually, in fact, most of the bands who complain, in fact, that nobody come and support them, also don't support local but bands. But can I? That is which helps. True. Yeah, which doesn't help. You yeah, can, because can, I mean, you're actually burning yourself. Can actually. I add more to yeah. that? But it. That doesn't mean that I'm consuming mm. Western or Hollywood or Bollywood um, mm. market. It's it's more to because of this digital digitalized world. Um, I mean, I think we consume more either pirate pirated things online or we 
watch more things on Astro on or on TV. Yeah, you can get pirated stuff. You can get pirated yeah. local stuff too, but nobody gets them. So, no, the issue is not that. I'm not. I'm not saying uh, wh- whoever you know that you people mm-hmm. tend to not uh, watch local stuff. Because there was a perception qualitative difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is local service inferior, for example. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say that one in ten are very good, mm-hmm. but many are indeed not so good. But w- here is where we have a problem because if local people do not support local artists, then this state of making inferior local products mm. will perpetuate, will continue. It's a vicious Beca- cycle. It's a vicious cycle. Mm. So it's, it's a cycle that we somehow as a community needs to break. Mm. Yeah, but uh, I don't know how. If I, if I knew, I wouldn't be sitting here. But <laughs> I'd be out there selling a million records. But... Um, but that is actually one of the key things, right? But now. it's interesting to see because when when I was much more young, <laughs> mm-hmm. in the early two thousand late nineties, I actually have a huge taste in the local market mm-hmm. because it's it's really the kind of music I sure. dig into. But the older I get, the kind of music that I like also change. Sure. But there seem to be very little um, local producer for that kind of genre that I like so I think it's harder to find oh, for sure it's, uh, it's also the question of access maybe yeah. they are that kind of music genre that I like um, more I guess um, the sort of uh, matured kind of music genre but I feel that the access is not there mm-hmm. um platforms is not as sure. widely available as well again it's go back to the same thing right mm-hmm. I mean if there was if there was a market for it there would be the platform for it Mm. But there isn't a market for it, so there isn't a platform for it. Uh, it's going down to population, but it's not just an issue of population. If you look at, say, for example, the Hong Kong scene, mm. the Hong Kong scene's got maybe six million people in it, but it's still bigger than Malaysia. Why? Because all of them support local stuff. Mm. Yeah. Whereas one in fifty of your consumption is local stuff, so that doesn't support the local industry, mm. and that becomes mm. a problem. And so that also doesn't give our talents jobs in the industry because and and y- in so far as they do uh, attract certain people to work uh, into a, in the industry, uh, the number is small and perhaps the talent is mm-hmm. not top because we're not attracting top talent because mm-hmm. this industry doesn't pay top dollars. For example, so, so that becomes a problem. So, do you think the current industry right now is still running on that vicious cycle, oh, or is absolutely. that means it's not slowing down? It's in like trying to reverse back to a much. I mean, more we have. I mean, when we talk about industry here, we don't really have an industry. You know, we have a hobby. We have a very expensive mm-hmm. hobby. So, uh, very few people actually make money full time. Uh, artists, I mean make money full time from the industry very few I would say you know with, with an industry this big which involves thousands uh, tens of thousands of people I mean what 50, 100 people make money full time I mean make uh, make make a career out of it uh, which is very few so a lot of them are essentially part timers doing stuff um, which of course is not healthy and it's something that we need to do more to, to correct but it's really it starts you can say the government must support the government support. I don't believe in that in particular p- particular case. That we have to. We must only rely on the government. I think a lot of it is down to the community. As a community, do we want to support our own artists? Mm-hmm. I mean, do you? And I tell you, in Japan, it happens. Do you go to see a local act, and they are terrible? Do you say, well, you know what? I'm going to give them another chance because they are local. I mean, you know what I'm saying? and this is the Japanese mentality because they suck, but hey, they're my people. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So if everybody do that, there'll be thousands of bands given the opportunity. Maybe two will make it. And because that would be the percentage worldwide, actually, only two of uh, a thousand will probably make it. Now, um, but those two will be exceptionally good mm-hmm. and they'll be international. But they became international because they built off a local, strong local base. Mm-hmm. Happens in Japan, happens in Korea. Yeah, it does. Right? 
the amount of support Korean artists get from Koreans in Korea is ridiculous. It's really up to It's unreal. Level. Yeah. You know, and sometimes they're actually not so good. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah? Honestly. But they get supported anyway because, look, he's our ex. Mm. In Malaysia, we only acknowledge a local artist once they've gone international. And say, hey, you know, Michelle, who, you know, Dato, or whatever it is. That's wrong. You support local acts when they're young, when they're weak. But where does that mentality come from? Or is Insecurity. It mm-hmm. Insecurity. Yeah. Insecurity, lack of uh, uh, identity that everybody buys into. Mm-hmm. Uh, or is it also because of language? Language is it divided? Correct. Because Japan it's and fragmented. Korea, we have Correct. one language. It, it's fragmented. As, yeah. as, uh, I started out saying this, which yeah. are 30, 30 million fragmented into four languages. Mm-hmm. You become very, very small. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you have to work with that kind of uh, pla- a template, mm-hmm. a template, you know, I mean, you cannot change the demographic anyway. People will continue to speak their mother tongue or mm-hmm. whatever uh, language that they understand. How can we grow from there? Well, you have to. I believe you have to buy into the idea that that regardless of your language, regardless of of your differences, uh, that you're Malaysian. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about it. There was only one thing. In fact, there was only one element in Malaysian social life that transcends religion, race, and so on and so forth. What is it? Badminton. <laughs> it's possible. Who cares whether that guy is Chinese or Malay? <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Who cares whether he's Indian? Nobody cares. I mean, you see those people waving the flag? The flag? Yeah? yeah. Mm-hmm. It's possible. We just haven't been able to translate that into other areas. But whenever Chong Wei plays, my God, you understand? <laughs> right? So, it is possible. And that's one moment where the whole country is united. The Malaysian football team used to do that in mm-hmm. the 70s. But we've been... We've been far away from that for a long time. Fading you know? away. <laughs> right? uh, but yeah, but um, a lot of it, a, a lot of it is it is possible. You don't have to be homogenous culturally because I don't. I'm not one of those who agree that you have to be homogenous mm. to be united. I think, like I said before, if you look at badminton, you look at the the, the, the soccer team that went to the Olympics in the in the late 70s and early 80s. That whole country behind them. You know, so it is possible, but we we, we haven't we've. We screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> but then we also need to look at the standard. How do we maintain the standard, the quality? Mm. Because people tend to compare to the standard of the Western or any other countries to Malaysian standard. Mm. And they have this mindset, fixed mindset that, ah, Malaysian standard, not really good. We'd rather go for, you know, if we pay for tickets or anything else, we, why don't we just pay for so the commitment, better? isn't it? I think, yeah. I, no, fair enough. I mean, there's a, a lot of argument for saying, look, if I'm going to pay 50 bucks to see to see a local act, uh, play 150 mm-hmm. bucks to see a Hollywood act, rather I would rather play 150 bucks yeah. because it represents a better value for money. I understand that argument. Mm-hmm. But I'm not making the argument though. I'm making the argument that this is your band. This is your people. This is your land. This is your pavement. This is your musical note. Yeah, This is your musicians. These are your young people singing about their homes and their experiences and they are falling out of love, they are broken hearted or they, they are pissed off and so on and so forth. These are your voices. Mm-hmm. How much money do you put on it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't put money on that. And uh, our neighboring countries, they are following the footstep of Japan and Korea, Indonesia more so. Good. Indonesia yeah. more so. Again, Philippine. Indonesia is very different because Indonesia has got a huge market, mm-hmm. so they have a different different sort of issue. Singapore, eh, not really. Uh, How about Philippines? I'm I'm not familiar with mm-hmm. Philippines to, uh, enough mm-hmm. with Philippines to comment. There seem to be a growing music Thailand industry in the CLMB oh, yeah, countries. Yeah, Thailand is huge. That's Local acts are huge in Thailand. Mm-hmm. So that is true. Um, so yeah, different countries, different things, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, with with Korea, in many ways, that's actually the best example mm-hmm. of how to handle it. Because not only did they encourage um, and support local Korean voices, but they, they are, the level of their support is so huge that they actually helped them export it. Mm. I mean, I mean, you know, Korean drama. Imagine before Korean drama became popular in Asia. I mean. Uh, what happened in Japan was that they actually 
paid TV stations in Japan to show them to show Korean drama.、Mm-hmm. Once they're hooked, then they you can they have to pay for it. But the first few times, they actually paid the government paid. Right. So it was subsidized、mm-hmm. uh, to this extent. So. So certainly, I mean, in terms of how the Koreans did it, is very much the sort of model that I think we should be following. I think,、mm-hmm. and also it's not just like giving money. I mean, you know, in Korea, I think the the quality of technical、mm-hmm. production is so high now; it's almost Hollywood standard. So, especially in film. But for them to get there, it took a lot、education. of nationalist well, national support. Well, not just education and good policy. I、mm-hmm. think here, I mean, we rather buy hardware. I mean, you if you. If you see where the money goes in art spending, here you're buying the best console, best studios, best equipment, outboards, and so on and so forth. Actually, you don't need that to make good records.、Uh, it helps, but you don't really need that.、Yeah. Or in the world of film, they may have the best sound equipment, best camera, and so on and so forth. But nobody is spending money on education.、Mm-hmm. You're not spending、true. money on workshops. You're not spending money on, for example, one of the critical areas we have to improve in film would be say. Two areas. One is sound. We do terrible location sound、mm-hmm. and post-production sound in this country, and that's fifty percent of your experience as a f- as an audience in a film.、Mm-hmm. Audio, yeah, it's fifty percent of your experience, and we、right. are terrible at it, right? The other thing we're terrible is script writing. We actually have pretty poor script writers.、Mm-hmm. So why aren't we spending the money educating our script writers? Why aren't we giving flying over ten of the best in the world? And it won't cost much money. Right and teach our kids. This is how you write a script,、mm-hmm. or this is how you record location sound. When you make content in this day and age, it's no longer about hardware. There's no point sitting, sitting down there and say, "Look, you know, I want, I, 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 we need an Alexa camera."、Yeah. You know, I mean, if you can't shoot with an iPhone, you can't shoot with an Alexa. So, I mean, so the issue is, if you're making content, then it's really much more about Look, every film starts on a page. That's true. <laughs> I mean, <yeah. laughs> every film starts with a blank page. So,、mm-hmm. if you if your script is is not good, it's unlikely that you will be able to make a good film. Countries like Iran, which is obviously、Correct. they are lacking a lot in terms of the hardware,、Correct. but they managed to pull off an、Correct. Oscar-winning movie. Correct. That's exactly my point. Yeah. yeah, exactly my point. And if you look at some of the early, f- before the Korean wave came out improper, if you look at some of The early films of Korean filmmakers, indie filmmakers, made for very little money.、Mm-hmm. They're excellent. I mean, they're brilliantly written, really, really cool written.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's not really about that. I think somehow we sort of got that wrong. So that means the vicious cycle has somehow、uh, jeopardized, you know, our our software more than our hardware. I mean, our, our hardware seems to getting grander and bigger and. And、seems to be sh- yeah, but I mean that's that's not just shinier, that's not that's not not just a, that's not just about uh, uh, a market.、Mm-hmm. I mean that's one element. The size of the market affects、mm-hmm. how we are not learning. But in terms of there's a whole national culture for thirty years of not wanting to learn anyway. That is、mm-hmm. true. I mean you know when's the last person you met who really went and did the job because it's pride in it. That's true. I mean, we've somehow, as a national thing, lost that pride in our work. Whereas, if you talk to, a, especially in, in、uh, I'm very familiar with Japan, especially if you go to Japan, it is really about just so. I mean, this is perfect, and if it's not perfect, I'm going to move it until it's perfect. I don't care if I work five hours more. I don't、mm-hmm. care if the money is exactly the same. But this is pride. I got to get it right because my name is on it.、Mm. Um. And in Japan, you you see that again and again and again. I mean, that's the only place in the world where I get set tag rider as a performer. And if I'm playing solo, it's very simple, right? I just have a DI box for my guitar. I have a mic. I specify the mic, so it's very simple. And they write back. They say, "Well, Mr. Teo,、uh, we notice that when you play solo, you sit down. <laughs> How tall is your stool?" Yeah. Wow. Very specific. That is very specific. Now that is、yeah. how people get、mm. excellent work done.、Mm. So and、mm. and you go do sound check in Japan, they would have pre EQ my vocal channel and sound check last five minutes. Yeah. You're not supposed to rehearse on that, man. You supposed、yeah. to just go、that、go out there and、true. just do five minutes, come down and go and have your orange juice or whatever、yeah. it is, <laughs> right? Now, so people work hard. It's a different mentality. I think we've we used to have it. I mean,、mm. we used to be a very craft based economy. 
we used to have you know people who make crafts, make cups, make coffee, Everything make is made in China. yeah, all those stuff. Nowadays we we don't tend to have that no more, and mm-hmm. I think I think that's a detriment to us. I think we've lost something, mm-hmm. and we have to get it back. I mean, because I mean, if you want to make good work, whether whether it is making a good glass or a good table and chair, a good door or a good piece of music or a good film, it's the same mentality. Mm-hmm. Is <laughs> no, I'm not taking a break. <laughs> I'm doing this until it's right, mm. because yeah, because it has to be right. Is 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 about being totally obsessed by needing to put out your best work, uh, rather than, hey, you know, whether it's good or bad, I'm going on TV anyway. <laughs> you know, but that's not the point. The point mm. is doing good work. The point is not going on TV. Mm. Mm. That's the whole philosophy that we need to relearn back. <laughs> from well, I hope. I, I mean, I'm 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 getting sort of. I don't know. I hope you know what our generation have not been managed, to, uh, not managed to do. I hope obviously the younger generation will do it because mm-hmm. I think, in many ways, being brought up in a world where that's smaller on the internet might represent a big break. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that yeah. will be the case because that would be wonderful. Yeah. With that, thank you very much. No, thank you for speaking to me. Thank yeah. you very much. I hope, uh, wake up, everybody. <laughs>